Thank you, Mickey. Uh, I'm Susan Patrick, and I'm very pleased to be here uh, with you and everyone at ALEC. I'm a huge fan of this organization and believe very strongly in the principles that you stand for. And I think one reason we're here today to talk about 21st century learning is not only to ask what does 21st century learning look like, but how can we bring in free enterprise principles to completely transform education today. And that is a critical role that we have to take on as our students enter what is not just a, a U.S. competitive environment, but a globally competitive environment. And as you know from talking to um, students in your districts all over the country, kids are aware of this. Kids know that they're entering a globally competitive environment. They want to be challenged. They want to be given options. And they want to have technology-rich learning environments with really terrific teachers guiding them. So starting with that, uh, I just want to quote from a U.S. Department of Commerce study that ranked 55 industries in the United States on their IT intensiveness. And where did K-12 education fall? Ranked dead last at number 55. So even though in the United States we've spent $60 billion in the last 10 years of taxpayer-funded money on computers and education, they largely have been laid over the existing bureaucratic system so that we have a ratio of four computers uh, oh, four students to one computer, and usually they're sitting in the back of classrooms collecting dust. Now, integrating technology into existing classrooms isn't the answer. The answer is understanding what is needed for a system redesign that provides student-centered learning. We know that every learner does not learn at the same pace or in the same mode or in the same way. It is too hard for one teacher that stands up in front of 25 or 30 kids to personalize and individualize instruction for every child. It's too hard. With technology, we can make that happen, and we can create new efficiencies in the systems, redesigning every course, providing much more dynamic and increased resources. Today, we have 23 states that are locked into textbook adoption policies. That is, money is being, uh, $9 billion nationwide of money is being locked into these old policies that don't allow us to move into these new formats of engaging digital curriculum, of new in, individualized, customized instruction. Um, we've got lots of changes on the horizon, and there are some really promising innovations that are showing that they work that are happening, and I want to talk a little bit about those too. So online learning in the United States in K-12 education in the last 10 years is a rapidly growing innovation, growing perhaps faster than any other innovation in K-12 education, and in my mind that's a really good thing, 30% annually, although that's not even. In some of your states, it's growing at 100% annually. Why? Where students have choices and can take online courses or enroll in programs on demand, those numbers are increasing at 50% up to 100% annually. In other states where they're limited by enrollment caps or laws or policies based on seat time and inputs, not student outputs or performance, you'll see growth rates much lower, sometimes 15%, sometimes flat. So this is all about state control and state control of policy and adapting and upgrading policies into the 21st century world that we live in. Policies today that exist were created in a time 30, sometimes 50 years ago, in a time where they never conceived that you could get a really terrific teacher from across state, uh, from across your state, from across districts that could teach kids in rural districts that don't have access to those courses. Never foresaw a time when a student in Kentucky could take Mandarin Chinese from any location co-taught by a Mandarin teacher in China practicing with students over in Beijing overseas. That is happening today. In fact, Michigan, Kentucky, Virginia all offer online Mandarin Chinese courses to students in high school. Ask yourself, does every student in your state have access to a world-class education? Now let's just take a look at what a world-class education means today. In the European Union, the International Baccalaureate Program last fall began an IB, um, International Baccalaureate Dipro Diploma Program online. They are training what they call master teachers 
to teach online. They have redesigned their curriculum, keeping to the rigorous standards that they have academically, but moving that into online formats that are dynamic, allow discussions from students, not just within states or countries, but across 125 countries globally. So you've got kids in Europe learning with kids in Asia, in the Middle East, and some students in the United States. Ask yourself, does every student who's gifted and talented or high-performing, college-ready in your district have access to that quality of education or those opportunities. Today, technological innovations make so much more possible. We can have access to the highest quality teachers and newly redesigned courses that offer a whole variety of customized learning approaches. I'll give you another example. Let's head to Turkey. Turkey three years ago had zero students taking online courses. Their Ministry of Education looked across the best <laughs> fire drill. <laughs> Do we need to evacuate? <laughs> Okay, we won't talk about Turkey anymore. <laughs> All right, we'll talk about India and then we'll move on. <laughs> so India is, uh, no, Turkey is now in three years has 15 million students taking online courses. They evaluated the best private providers. They're offering digital curriculum, training master teachers to teach online. That's true scalability. In the U.S., we may have 30% growth over the last decade, but we only have uh, a million students who are able to take online courses. Back to policy, this is because of the policy barriers that exist mostly at the state level. There are a number of states that have fought these um, policy battles and opened access to online learning. 21 states do allow for full-time online programs and uh, virtual charter schools. It's interesting because in those states, they're creating a dynamic that sometimes comes head to head with issues in brick and mortar schools, issues of quality, issues of access, issues of equitable funding. And guess what? The online programs are seeing better results. In fact, that's happening across the board. A U.S. Department of Education study last summer that was put out showed that students that take online classes are not only more engaged but based on student achievement are outperforming traditional students. Why? This is true in blended models where they're using online courses and strategies in classrooms. Again, this isn't just sitting at the back and playing on that dusty computer every now and then. It's totally redesigning the curriculum retraining teachers um, to completely teach online to personalize and customize that instruction. So uh, if you keep going overseas, you'll see that other countries are not looking at online learning and blended learning as the side project in ed tech, the way it's been approached uh, largely in this country, but as a fundamental strategy for redesigning and reforming their education system. And this is true in China, where in the next 10 years they plan to reach 100 million more students through online learning by training master teachers to teach online and delivering online courses. In India, where in the next 10 years they have a goal for universal access to K-12 education, they would have to build 200,000 new schools. Guess what? Money's tight. They're not going to do it. What are they going to do? They've got teacher shortages. They're going to train their very best teachers to teach online, and they're internationally benchmarking digital curriculum. Guess what? They see that as an export opportunity for their country, and they're talking about it that way. India also has a university engaged in a $10 laptop per child initiative. So. We may be okay on this front today, but other countries are moving very, very fast. And we're not only going to find ourselves as we are today, what's not working? We're spending $10,000 per student per year in the U.S. in K-12 education.